Well, it was when well, we got together for lunch and we started to explore, and, and it's not that uh, we've, <clears throat> we've had our eyes open for a, a couple, three years, ever sure. since COVID, uh, about how do we be most effective in this city moving forward. Uh, the Walnut location uh, has been three different places in the city since 1904, yeah. started as People's Mission Church, became Pilgrim Holiness, became Wesleyan Methodist, and then we became uh, just Wesleyan Church in 1968, along with the rest of the denomination. What are yeah. you gonna do, right? Yeah. But <laughs> the mission never changed, and it's to project the image of God, take mm -hmm. Jesus to the people. Yeah. You know, we think a lot about um, how you get people into the church, but Jesus didn't say, draw people to the church. Jesus said, you go to yeah. the people, take the church to the people. And the only way that we're gonna attract people to Jesus is if they see Jesus in us. Yeah, So. yeah, that's good. And I think a foundational component of that is being able to recognize, so there's, there's probably a difference between being created in the image of God and being part of the family of God. Like, I think being part of the family of God is subsequent to that, right? But all of us, no matter whether we understand who Jesus is or not, all of us are crafted in the image of God, yeah. right? That Imago Dei, and the way we say it is that people are beautiful creations mm -hmm. and we're created to create beautiful things together, right? Yeah. And the way that we do that is by recognizing the beauty of the image of God in you and in you and in you. And, um, and when we see that, then we begin to say, hey, you have value because you are, because God made you the way that you are. Hey, I'd love to invite you into his family as well. And I think that's something that, that the, the Walnut folks have done really beautifully for decades, is to see the value of the image of God in every human being, whether they're in service on Sunday or whether they're being fed a meal in the parking lot on Saturday or whether they're in a recovery group on any day of the week. Like, that's one of the things that I really love about that branch of our family is the history of honoring the Imago Dei. Yeah, and the, the understanding that all of us as God's creations and his desire for us to be his children, uh, we're all deserving of his love and his love is most often showed through his people. Yeah. So if, if we're operating in the image of Christ uh, and projecting the image of Christ, we are being accepting and loving. Yeah, we love people wherever they're at, mm -hmm. but uh, we love them too much to let them stay, to let them stay there. And yeah. you and I have both uh, preached, I've heard you preach it, about uh, where the Bible talks about us being created to do good works that yeah. were designed ahead of time for yeah. us. Yeah. So there's a plan, there's a purpose that we've all got. And uh, helping people find their purpose mm -hmm. in Christ is one of the most beautiful things about the whole journey. Yeah, I love that. And for us, that, that idea of helping people find their purpose and, and not just finding it, but actually like living into it is really, really important. So. We're excited about where we're headed yeah. as a church. We're excited about the opportunity to get to know one another's stories better. We're excited about what God is going to do in our in our family as we grow together as a community and also what he's going to do beyond that. Because here's the thing that I think is really beautiful is that Jesus says that we'll be known by what? By our love for Preacher. one another. Mm -hmm. And and he this is one of my favorite things to teach actually is we think about that and we go, oh well, yeah, we love each other, great, fine, whatever. But if you look at the context of the disciples and who he's talking to in that moment, he found Jesus had a, an uncanny knack for finding the marginalized and lifting them up. And so he took this, these disciples, and if you look at the, the, the story of the gospels and, the, and the, the context of who these actual disciples were, you could not have found 12 more different individuals in all of Israel. And so, and so they're politically different, they're religiously different, they're ethnically different, they're, they, they have different accents, they're different from places, like they are very, 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 very different. Some of them are businessmen, some of them are priests, some of them are not sure what they are, and you've got zealots and tax collectors, like these are people that should not be in the same room. And Jesus has the nerve, <laughs> as he often does, Jesus has the nerve to tell that group of miscreants hey, by the way, the, the way that people are gonna know that you belong to me is if you guys that can't get along love one another. And I think we have the opportunity as, 
as a combined family now to begin to highlight that and to showcase that. Even though we come from different backgrounds, even though we've, we've been in different parts of the city, even though we have some slightly different styles of worship, even though there are differences, we coming together and loving one another is going to be what helps people see that we belong to Jesus and highlight for them the love of God. And we can't wait Amen. for the journey. Amen. See you soon. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's okay. How's everybody doing? Oh, yeah. We hide. We, yeah. It was good. It was a good moment. Hey, good to see you. Uh, if you didn't know, my name is Pastor Brandon, and I get to serve as one of the leaders here. And uh, I'm super excited about all of that. And like we set this up. I know that was a little bit longer video than we would normally do, but I want to make sure we set the ground for the value of story as we move forward as a, as a new combined family. So just a couple of quick updates um, regarding the merger process. As you may have already heard, last Sunday, uh, our, the legacy branch of Now Our Family voted unanimously to join Story Church and become one body. So that's really good news. That's amazing. Super excited about that. So here's how that's going to kind of work. So this Wednesday, everybody say this Wednesday. This Wednesday night, I think we've got a slide for this, but this Wednesday night we're going to re-engage and start community nights again. Um, so both branches of our family will be here in this space. Uh, by the way, if you haven't been to that before, you're totally missing out. It's a great time. Bring a dish to share because we're going to start at, the, at 630. We're going to eat together. Then we're going to have a short time of worship. Then we're going to pray. And then we're going to break out into groups. And this semester, we've got a great lineup of groups. So if you've got students or you are a student, middle school or high school, uh, that will be a group that we'll break out into. Uh, Jen is going to be leading a women's group on a book called Forgive. How many of y'all know in this day and age, we need to learn how to forgive one another. Um, I'm going to be moving the men's group that I've been doing on Saturday mornings to Wednesday night to make that a little bit more accessible. Um, and then we've also got a Bible study group and a recovery group. Like it's going to be a really great full slate of options for everybody. So don't miss out on that. And then uh, a little drum roll, please. Drum roll. In just two short weeks from today, on October 15th, our Walnut friends will be joining us here on Sundays at the airport campus. Uh, and then we're going to all, like while we meet here, we're going to be doing renovations to that space, and then we'll move there when that's ready. That's, that date is TBD. I've got a close idea on it. I just don't want to announce it just yet. Um, but we've got, we're getting really close to having full renderings from the architect. So we can show you the plans that we have to reinvigorate that space. And guys, I'm telling you, like you saw even in that building, how many of you guys have been over there so far, by the way? Okay, great. A good number of us. Um, if you've already been over there, you already know that it has like great bones. There's, there's some beauty that already exists there. It needs some lipstick and rouge. It needs a little bit of love. It needs a little bit of updating. Kind of like me. Maybe not the lipstick part, um, but, but a little updating wouldn't hurt. Um, but it's shaping up to be a really, really beautiful space. And, um, and, and what I love about it is that, like I said, it's got good bones and we're going to be like all the renovations that we're doing are, we're working to highlight its existing beauty. So like, for instance, when we came in to K land, we didn't say, Oh, we're going to come into here and we're just going to change the whole place. No, we said, let's see what God is already doing. Let's see what is already beautiful and shine God's light on that and let that grow further. So that's kind of the same thing we want to do there is we want to highlight the existing beauty, accentuate those things, and then make it more accessible, make it more functional, make it more welcoming. It's going to be beautiful. And, and let's just go back a couple of weeks in messages, right? We're going to just jump back into Home Depot church mode. Okay. So you can do it. We can help. Everybody say you can do it. We can help. How about I can do it and I'm going to help even better. And how can I help? You might say, well, I'm glad that I asked that great question for you. Um, we're going to have a church-wide workday on October 14th. So two weeks from yesterday, we're going to have a workday over at the space. Uh, there is a sign up in the lobby. If you haven't already signed up, Mark's got that created. We'll have different opportunities. So like if you're afraid of lifting heavy things, we've got other things for you. If you're afraid of like cobwebs, we've got other things for you. If you want to paint, if you want to help, if you want, there's a bunch of different projects that we'll be working on that day that are getting it ready for construction, getting it ready for us to be able to do the things that we need to do. There's going to be more details about that coming, but it'll be Saturday the uh, 14th. And we're just going to, we're just going to say from 10 AM, I think is what we're going to say. And if, if that adjusts, we'll let you know. Um, and yeah, but I love the idea 
that we together get to be uh, get to participate in the the process of redeeming space for God's kingdom. Amen. Okay, so then we'll be over there for as one family, excuse me, over here as one family until phase one of construction and renovation is done. And then again, I'll have more details on those dates, but you should also be able to check out the, the merger update page on our site if you've got questions or just grab me or Jen or Mark or D or whomever. So, all right, everybody ready to jump into the word? All right, so last week, David Galvan did a fantastic job keeping us going in the Thin Places series. And I love that he reminded us that there are things that we do as individuals that can affect an entire community. So like we saw that Barnabas was doing something as an individual that affected the whole community because of his generosity in a positive way. And the text tells us that this is an example of the community actually being all taken care of because of the generosity of folks who had more means. In fact, this is the first time we hear the name Barnabas and it's not even his given name, right? His name is actually Joseph, but he gets a nickname. How cool is that, right? Hey, my name is Joe. I got some money for you. Oh, that's super cool, Joe. Can I call you Barney instead? Because, you know, Barney just sounds more fun and encouraging. And from that point on, everybody knows Joe as Barney. And then Ananias and Sapphira, as we talked about last week, well, they kind of want some nicknames too. They want, they want to be in on this. So they do something as individuals, but they also hold back. They weren't wholehearted. They weren't open-handed. In fact, it seems to me that they weren't trying to give so much as they were trying to get recognition. And, and Barney was trying to give. He wanted to be generous. And as a result, his generosity further solidified his reputation as an encouraging presence in the community. But Ananias and Sapphira, they, they didn't want to give. They wanted to keep some back. They wanted to get recognition for what they were doing. And they wanted to kind of have it both ways. And the trick is, is that you can have it both ways to a degree. You can be blessed for giving, but you can't manipulate that blessing for your own benefit and get away with it. Does that make sense? Okay. So one individual was open-handed and wholehearted and was able to affect the entire community positively. The other individuals were close-handed and half-hearted, and that affected the entire community as well. It says that from that point forward, when they died and the, and the, and the Lord struck them dead for what they did, it caused fear to go throughout the community. It was a big, big deal. And so we pick it up here. There's fear in the community. People are afraid to be around. They're not sure what to do. And then if we pick it up in Acts chapter five, verse 12, it says the apostles are healing people, right? So the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colony. So in the temple, no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits and all of them, everybody say all of them, all of them were healed. So God is still doing amazing things in and through Peter and John and the other apostles. But then we pick it up here in verse 17. It says, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. That word jealousy in the Greek is zelo, zelu, which is, which is the word we use for, where we get the word zeal. Okay. And there's some, there's some ways in which we use zeal really healthily. And there's some ways in which we use zeal that are not so healthy. And in this situation, then not so healthy, they arrested the apostles and they put them in the public jail. And Romans 10 uh, says it this way, brothers and sisters, this is Paul talking brothers and sisters. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved for. I can testify about them that they are zealous. They're zealous for God, but their zealu is not based on knowledge since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own. In other words, they didn't understand that Jesus was coming to take care of all of these things. So they tried to work it up in themselves. How many of us have all been guilty of this at one point or another? We said, Oh, I don't, I don't, I know God, you're good and you're going to do that, but I'm going to just try and figure out how to do this on my own. And then we fall on our face. We go, Oh yeah, that's right. I can't do it anyway. God, I need your help. Well, the problem in this scenario is that the Sadducees didn't take that next step. So 
Paul says here is that Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. But the Sadducees used the zeal that they had, the jealousy that they had for something that wasn't healthy and something that wasn't good. And Proverbs 19, two says it this way, desire and the word here is zeal would without knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. The, the NLT says it this way. Enthusiasm without knowledge is not good. Haste makes mistakes. And there's this moment in John chapter two, where Jesus clears the temples, right? We've heard this story where Jesus comes into the temples and the, the money changers are there and the people who are selling sacrifices are there. And Jesus comes in, he makes a whip, a cat of nine tails, which I can go into detail on that at another time, but it's a mean nasty weapon. It's actually the one that would be used on him later on. And he clears out the temples and it says in John 2 17, his disciples remembered in that moment, zeal for your house will consume me. And that, that moment, that quote that they're using, it comes from Psalm 69, nine. It says, uh, David is saying zeal for your house consumes me. And we don't know the exact, concept, uh, the exact context and the exact circumstances under which this was written. But David, as we know, if you've read anything about the life of David, you know that he's got a long list of complaints and tribulations. He's falsely accused. He's maligned uh, in his reputation. He's persecuted. He's chased. He's targeted. And if you know anything else about his story, you know that even his boss, King Saul, tried to, to, tried to kill him. He's got a long list of misadventures some of which he deserved and repented of, and some of which were just the failures and insecurities of the people around him. So King Saul tried to kill him. His son Absalom tried to usurp the kingdom and kill him as well. And so there's these, all these different things that David has experienced and he's talking about them in the context of Psalm 69. And he's crying out to the Lord to save him and to relieve him. And I wonder if maybe Psalm 69 in that regard is just this sort of cumulative retrospective of all of David's trials. Maybe he's speaking more specifically. Maybe this is like him remembering. I don't know. But that being said, there's a contrast here to be made. David is talking about the zeal for God's house consuming him in the midst of trial and tribulation. And it's a contrast to that which is being of said of him and, and is a confirmation of his heart for God, even and especially in moments that are difficult. And this is one of the key aspects of his character. And that we're also seeing in a moment from John and Peter that makes him a person that God would say, a man after my own heart. See, David loved God and he made it always a practice to go directly to God for direction in almost every single one of his life circumstances. This is what John 2.17 is referencing of David when he, the disciples say, Jesus, when Jesus is cleansing the temple, zeal for your house consumes me. See, Jesus was passionate about the purification of the faith. Jesus was passionate about his own relationship with the father and passionate about helping people see the truth and subsequently the true nature and reason for the temple. Remember, this is happening in the temple. Remember, we've talked this entire book of Acts circles around, centers around the idea of what takes place in the temple. We know that the temple is a place where, where heaven and earth meet. We know that the temple is a, is a powerful and dangerous place. And all of the conflicts that we find it throughout the book of Acts, whether it's in Jerusalem or in Athens or in in, in, in Philippi or in Rome, all of these things center around conflict around what happens in the temple. And Jesus was passionate about people understanding the true nature of the temple, the place where God and man met the place, not where men abused that perception to make money. And the other component of that moment where Jesus is clearing out the temple is that we, we often go, oh yeah, well, they're, they're, they're making money there. That's not right. They're, they're subverting the system. They're, it's, it's corrupt. That's, that's what Jesus is going after. And those, that reading of the scripture there is true. Jesus is after the corruption that is existing in the religious system at that point. And I would say today, Jesus is still after the corruption that exists in the religious system of America or across the world. He's still after the things that we abuse or manipulate or, or try to try to manufacture things that look like God so that we can take advantage of those things. Jesus is still very concerned about those things, but here's, that's the obvious component of this, but there's another component here. I think there's a deeper meaning to this moment that Jesus is, is clearing out not only the, the corruption, but he, it says the money changers 
And it was the folks that were also selling sacrifices. So like they would sell a dove for the dove sacrifice. They would sell a goat for the goat sacrifice. Like you would come to the temple and you would pay for the sacrifice that you were going to make to atone for your sin. And so Jesus isn't just clearing out the corruption of it. (laughs) He's not just clearing out that, but he's clearing out the means of sacrifice by which men could have their consciences cleared and guilt temporarily removed. Because Jesus himself was coming into the temple to become the sacrifice, whereby people, all people could be free, whereby all people could be completely forgiven, whereby all people could have access to the presence of God without another intermediary intervening. Jesus is cleansing the temple because he is the temple. Jesus is cleansing the temple because he's making us the temple. Jesus is clearing the temple courts with the same whip that will be used on him later so that we can all fellowship with God. Remember the temple is the place where heaven and earth touch. It's dangerous. It's powerful. And Jesus has come that we might all become, as the scripture says, become living temples of the Holy spirit that we together would be built up as living stones of the temple of God. And I want you to pay attention to what happens next. See, check this out. The the priests. So we're back to acts. Now the priests who were filled with zeal And I think we can safely say now that their zeal is more along the lines of the jealousy side of the definition and more along the the lines of zeal without knowledge side of the equation. But they put the apostles in jail for doing what the apostles were supposed to be doing. But look at what the angel does. Like I'm just going to tell the story because we're not going to read through it. What happens is in the middle of the night, the angel shows up and he opens the gates for the apostles and they walk right out. Okay, but I want you to pay attention to the specific directions and location that he gives the apostles when he miraculously lets them out of jail. All right. So verse 19, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Quote, go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail to go get the apostles. Like, okay, cool. Put them in jail. Now we're going to have our hearing. Let's go get them. Bailiff, bring the defendants out. But on arriving at the jail, the officers didn't find them there. So they went back and reported, hey, we went back to the jail. It's locked up. The guards are there. But when we opened the doors, they aren't there anymore. We didn't find them inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. In other words, they're nervous about not just their jobs, but their lives. Because if you let somebody out, it's on you. Then someone came and said, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They didn't use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Now, remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, when Jesus restored Peter, remember I told him he gave him two new strategies, right? He gave, he gave Peter two instructions when he restored him to leader, his leadership. He said, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And then he said, follow me. Isn't this exactly what the angel just instructed them to do? Peter is doing exactly, like almost word for word, in the exact same spot, In the exact same way, he's following Jesus's lead. Remember, this isn't years later. This isn't decades or, or in our case, centuries or millennia later. This is weeks or maybe months after Jesus had just been there doing the same stuff. Peter had just seen this. He had just seen Jesus on trial in front of the Sanhedrin. He had just seen Jesus beaten and mocked by the Sanhedrin. He had just seen Jesus heal people and preach the gospel and call people to repent and teach them and care for them and pray for them right here in this very spot in the temple. The memories are still fresh. They're not tainted by years of distraction or distanced by miles. Peter hadn't even gone to another city yet. This is Peter reenacting what Jesus had modeled for him for years. This Peter feeding the sheep, this Peter modeling, following Jesus and being obedient to the word of the Lord as delivered by the messenger, the angel, by the way, the word angel just means messenger. The word for the gospel, the good news that you, so on Gelion is the word for an, for angel or messenger. You is the preposition that means good. And it's a you on Gelion. It's where, it's where we get the word evangelism. 
It's sharing the good news. It's being a messenger of the good news. And you know that you and I are called to the exact same thing that Peter was called to do. Maybe we're not called to lead the whole church, but we're called to bring the good news just like he was. We're called to feed his sheep and to follow him, to be good messengers, to be faithful, to tell people exactly what God has told you, to model for people what Jesus has modeled for you, to be generous and kind and hospitable and loving and caring and compassionate and challenging, just like Jesus has been for you. But here's where it gets interesting. Look at the way that that, that, that zeal is used in this space. Verse 27. The apostles were brought and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah. You want us to make you guilty of the, of his blood. Well, you did that yourselves. He raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on the cross. God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who is also well known historically, a famous Pharisee teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little bit. And then he addressed the Sanhedrin and said, Hey, men of Israel, consider carefully what you are about to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and his followers dispersed. All came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean appeared in the, in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. So here's what I advise. Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. I read that this morning when I was kind of getting prepared again. And I I just thought about the process we're in with this merger. Like I said, I, I think I told you that when Danny and I first started talking, I thought, okay, we'll do some things throughout the fall. We'll get to know each other a little bit. We'll, we'll date a little while. We'll like see if we can hang out. We'll see if we get along. We'll see if we like the same music and want to go to the same movies or not. And I thought, okay, well maybe by, maybe by the beginning of 2024, we'll start to function a little bit together. And then maybe like by mid 24, we'll like actually put a ring on it. And then Danny called me four weeks ago now and said, hey, uh, my board voted unanimously tonight to move this to a vote, and we're ready to go. Okay, that's a little bit faster than I thought. That's good news, but that's faster. And, it, 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 and there was a moment, it, actually, in that conversation, that Tuesday night, I was coming back from a Men of Influence meeting. He called and said, hey, you got a minute. We were talking. It was like 9 or 10 at night. He told me about that. I was like, okay, this is good. Maybe we could push it back a little bit, give us a little more time, a little more time to pray, just think through this a little bit more. I said, but this is just happening a lot faster than I thought. That's, that's great news, but it's just faster. And he, and he said, Brandon, I just don't think we're driving anymore. I think the Lord is driving this process and we're, we just need to kind of get out of the way. And as I've watched conversation after conversation and, and circle after circle and, and group after group all come together and go, yeah, like I, I have some questions. I'm not sure how this part of this is going to work or, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about maybe being in a different space for a little while or whatever. But like at the end of the day, I think this is the right thing. And to have people unanimously go, yep, this is what we should be doing. If this, is a, this is one of these moments where we could fight this. We go, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. But I, th- I feel like just like Gamaliel is saying, like, you can fight this, but at that point, you, we're just fighting against what God is trying to do. So his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and they had them flogged and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And z- here's where the zeal is expressed in one more way. The word isn't used here, but the same sentiment exists. Verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, rejoicing because they had been counted. Oh, sorry. When they let them go, they beat the snot out of them first. Did I leave that out? That's a big detail. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped 
teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And the word rejoice here is interesting. It's from the root word Cairo, which is the same, same word for grace, charis, the same root for the word gift. In fact, it's the same word we, we use for the word communion, the word Eucharist. So we said evangelism is the good news. Eucharist, the communion is the good grace. It's also the same word that we use for the word charisma, the word we use for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural grace, a supernatural gift given by a supernatural God to imply the generosity of the giver of the gift. And that's really interesting to me because it also means just joy and to rejoice and to celebrate and to exult and be glad. And let's, let's put that gift of gladness designed to show the generosity of the giver back in its context. The apostles just had the snot kicked out of them. They've just gotten literally beaten within an inch of their lives. They were just rebuked by the Supreme court of their nation, told to keep quiet, told to stop doing what they were doing to cease and desist. They had just had their butts handed to them. And I, and I'm going to have just, let me just give you a little trigger warning. Okay. Um, I know last week watching the Broncos and frankly, the Rockies for the last 15 years, but especially the Broncos last week, they received a historic beat down 70 to 20 brutal, unbelievable, inexcusable, unacceptable kind of loss. They just got their keisters smacked around a field for a couple of hours on national TV. And I know as a fan, like I didn't feel like celebrating. I didn't like, and I didn't play the game. I wasn't there, but I was I, just full disclosure. I wasn't in a mood to put on all my Broncos gear and sp- start a spontaneous parade in my neighborhood. I know that sounds crazy, but I wasn't. And can you imagine how mad we as fans would be if those players and those coaches, if in their post game pressers, they were celebrating like they just won the Super Bowl? Can you imagine if they had like, you know, the goggles on and the champagne out and the music blaring? Like, all I do is win, 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 no matter what. They're just going for it, right? And they're on the way to the team bus and they're still doing it. Can you imagine how incongruent that would feel? That's exactly what the apostles do here. All I do is win. We're celebrating. We're partying. They're, they're parading. They're going house to house, street to street, calling it out. Never stop. Keep going. Keep on keeping on. And, and like that part, well, the part that makes sense to me is like when they see that Peter's shadow is healing people. That makes sense. Let's celebrate that, right? That's a big deal. That's dope. That's supernatural. Crazy cool. I can understand that like when Barney shows up with a big old pack, a uh, big old stack of cash and it's like, here you go. Take care of the people. That sounds like a party. Like I can understand when Holy Spirit shows up on the day of Pentecost and, and people are speaking in tongues and thousands of people get saved and baptized in one day. That sounds like a party. And I, can, I feel like when they saw Jesus alive in the flesh and eating fish again, that's a party. When they saw Jesus with their very own eyes ascend to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father, I can understand that as a party. I can understand when they see the miraculous at work and they had the favor of all the people. I can understand when the Lord added to their number daily the number of people that were being saved. I can understand all of that and the, the unity they were experiencing, the, the everything in common, the, the taking care of one another, the experience of the power and the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. In their lives. I can understand it when the dude who was crippled a couple of weeks ago got up and started running and leaping and shouting and dancing. Like that feels like a party. That feels like good news worth telling everybody about, right? But this being flogged, being beaten with a cat of nine tails, being rebuked publicly in front of God and the nation and all of your neighbors, being told to cease and desist, being told you can't do that around here anymore. We're going to put you in jail again if you do. Like, that's different. That's a different vibe. That's harder. That's, that, that's not normal. This is not human. And I, and I think about that. I think about how much different that is from us today. Like every time somebody disagrees with us or secular culture frowns upon a stance we take as a church or heaven forbid, somebody says something not so nice about you on face on social media. Like we freak out, right? We go to the mattresses. We lose our ever loving minds when people just disagree with us. So yeah, it's, that's true. It's, it's not human to respond that way. 
that rejoicing, that gladness, that grace, that recognition of God's goodness, and that, that gift of joy is exactly that. It's a gift. So how does that happen? Like, how do I have that kind of joy? How do I have that kind of peace? How do I find that kind of resolve for my own life? Ultimately, it just goes back to the same strategies that Jesus gave Peter. Feed my sheep. Follow me. It's all about open-handedness again. Feeding the sheep means you have to open your hands to, to give it away. It means you have to love one another as you love yourself. It means you have to care about them the way you care about yourself and the way that Jesus cares about them. Okay, cool. How do I do that? Follow me. The Peter following Jesus is just like Jesus following the Father. John 5.19 says this, Jesus gave them this answer, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. It all, he also goes on to say, I only say what I hear the Father saying. None of this is on my own. So, the sort of practical kind of six ways that we can do this together, all right? So, and we see this the way that Jesus does this. This would be a great thing, like take a picture of this or take a note on this. So, we've got preparation for a major task. So, after Jesus was baptized in Luke chapter 4, he, he spent 40 days praying and fasting because he was preparing for the ministry that he knew he was about to jump into. Maybe you have to recharge after hard work. In Mark 6, after Jesus had sent out the 12 to go do ministry, they came back and they were telling them all the stories. They're super excited. Like, we did this, and we did that, and the, the demons were cast out there, and that dude was healed. And Jesus is like, hey, 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 hey. I don't want to hear about that right now. I need you to go separate yourself from the people. Separate yourself from, from the notoriety and go spend time with God. Go reconnect there. In Mark 14, after Jesus learns about his cousin John the Baptist's beheading, what does he do? He goes away to a solitary place to get alone with the Father. In Luke 6, just before Jesus chose all of his disciples, this is a pretty important decision for him, right? These are the 12 people that are going to lead the church after he's gone. Just before he chooses all the disciples, Jesus goes away to pray. In Luke 22, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in a time of distress and impending difficulty, he spends significant time in prayer before going to be tried and crucified. And then, and this may be the most important one of all of them. It's the least dramatic and the most important. Ever say least dramatic, most important. Luke 5, 16 says that Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. In other words, he made it a habit. He made it a rule of his life. He's like, I'm going to put this first all the time. In other words, if, if, if you want to follow Jesus, it's not just to the cross. It's not just to make the big decisions. It's not just to prepare for the big miraculous moments. And those are all good things. It's not just to handle hardship. Following Jesus means to following him to the place of prayer, the place of worship, the place of solitude, the place of, of, of getting yourself alone with the father. It means spending significant, regular, recurring intentional time in prayer. It means knowing God and learning to know God the way that he knows you. And the only way to do that is to abide, to remain. In John 15, where Jesus says, remain in me as I remain in you. I will remain in the Father. It, 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 one translation says the word abide in that space. And the, the Greek word there is meno, and it has a couple of different iterations. It means to stay, like to stay at home, to remain, to be steadfast. Like it can also mean to like stay in the fight, in the battle, like don't give up, don't quit. It can mean to lodge or to live somewhere. It also means to tarry. And that's not, I know that's not a word that we use often in common American vernacular. Excuse me while I tarry. But I love the definition. It means to stay longer than you meant to. To stay longer than intended. To, to delay leaving a place. And it reminds me of like 
when Jen and I were falling in love. We got like a nice little music vibe. Like let's get the whole thing going now, right? But I remember like you, you, you spend more time on the phone or messaging or whatever you do these days. I don't know. We already, we already did it. We're good. Um, we still Terry. Okay. Um, we still hang out. We still, I think she's still, like, but I remember this one time, like she, we were on break and I was here in Colorado and she was on Cape Cod with her aunt and uncle. Was it Christmas? It was Christmas break. And like, we just meant to call real quick and just like connect for a little bit. And you know, there's a two hour time difference. So it was way later for her than it was for me. And the next thing you knew, it was like two in the morning and her uncle came downstairs and like, let her have it. Like, what are you doing? You should be in bed. And it was, I think he was grumpy because he was older and something woke him up. But like, but we were like, we were tarrying. We were, we were staying together on the phone in the conversation longer than we meant to. And I think that's what God is after in us. Like, we'll just stay a little longer. This is what it means to tarry. This is what it means to abide. This is what it means to remain. And I think this is that kind of remaining, that kind of tarrying is what allows us to have this kind of rejoicing. See, because we've been through some difficult things together. And we're not always happy about it. She's not always happy. I know this is surprising to you, but she's not always happy with me. I know. Shocker. But, but that, that relational connectivity, that regular recurring, we, like, we don't just hang out for an hour and a half once a week and talk then. Right? Like that, that wouldn't make for a good, great marriage. But we talk every day. We hang out every day. We, and sometimes we, it's just information sharing. Sometimes it's like, okay, well, what's your calendar look like? What's my calendar look like? Sometimes it's, how are we going to, you know, get the boys to their things, whatever. But, and sometimes it's deeper, but like, it's just the regular recurring. We're just connecting. And, and that regular sense of connectivity is what allows us to walk through difficult things and still have confidence. Like, I, I'm not worried about her leaving, usually. No, I'm not worried about her leaving because she's been faithful for 25 years in little mundane things. She's been faithful in difficult moments. She's been faithful in, in when I'm kind and when I'm unkind. She's been faithful when she's in a good mood or when she's in a bad mood. We're committed to this because we've, we've tarried. We've abided with one another. And I don't want you to get like get it twisted either. Like we've had some really hard things in our lives. We've created some really hard things for one another. We've been really unkind toward one another. Like it's not all happy go lucky, like roses and sunshine every day, all day around the sheep household. But we're committed to tarry. We're committed to abide, to dwell. And and I think if we 